What's going on? Welcome back to the channel. I'm about to go into jujitsu, but really quick, baby update. It is August 19th, Friday, August 19th. The due date was August 16th. Still no baby. Now, I was thinking about this, I was talking about this with a couple of my friends yesterday. Logically, I knew the due date was just like a, like a suggestion, like it was like an estimate. But emotionally, I was definitely not prepared for the reality of the situation. Like, I just, I'm like, okay, well, the baby's gonna be here by the 16th. Even though I logically didn't know that. And uh, so every moment is just like constantly checking my phone, see my wife is texting me, like, feeling her stomach, are we ready to go? Did your water break? Like, what's going on? So it's like, actually super stressful and everyone's like oh just relax enjoy the last couple days before the baby gets here and I know I get that and it's been wonderful but it's also super fucking stressful so uh, so no baby yet we have an inducement date for the 25th or the 26th so we still got like another week or so and that's it now we're gonna go do some jujitsu so let's get after it So going into this video, someone asked me the other day, they said, what are some red flags to look out for with like bad coaches? And I was thinking about how to answer this and I don't want to bash other coaches. Like I don't want my channel just to be about bashing other people. So what I decided I was gonna do in this video with Mitch is I'm gonna take you through a handful of things of mistakes that I made as a coach earlier in my career and then what I do now. So rather than me saying like, oh, this coach does this bad or that coach does this bad, I'm gonna take you through the mistakes that I made when I was a younger coach and how I fixed it now so you can get a better understanding of, okay, if a coach is doing this, it might not be a good idea. Also, it's worth knowing that Every single person, coach or not, makes mistakes. So I think one of the best things someone can do is admit when they were wrong, admit when they make mistakes, and look for that. Look for that within the coaches, within the people you follow. If they're not willing to admit that they were wrong or even that they just don't know the answer to something, that might be worth being aware of. So that's what this video is gonna be, just a, a bunch of different mistakes that I made earlier in my career and how I've rectified them going forward. How's the mat burn on the head? Do you see it still? Is it there or no? I could see it a little bit in the last video. No, it looks good. It, it was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen today because we're just doing a straight fight. We're not drilling that one move over and over and over again. What do you think went wrong there? <laughs> Where to begin? Oh, it's three years of jujitsu going against 20 years of jujitsu. That's what went wrong. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> Let me get him. <laughs> so time we do this. Yeah, question. Yeah. What do you do when your opponent lifts you into the air? <laughs> I should have stayed further back. I, sh I got too high. He shook me off. I should have been more like a backpack on him. But. That's exactly why. Right. Fucked up. You should have got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fajardo was good, a good day, good training day, got my ass kicked. Uh, it's fun, it's like just like looking for that one thing that I get better at every day, it's just like the one tiny thing. So like the thing we were drilling all week, I hit it once. So like that was enough where I was like, cool, making progress. Like the rest of the time I got my ass kicked, but I hit the one move that we were drilling all week one time, so I feel good about it. All 
All right, just got back from jujitsu, and my buddy Mike just told me we need to do a podcast right now. So let's go. Let's hit it. So I have my inner circle for fitness, but we also have another membership for business. It's called the Online Fitness Business Mentorship. So we help coaches become better coaches, teach them how to help clients with their nutrition, with their training, with their client psychology, and also show them how to build a successful business that doesn't scam people. Like we don't want coaches doing more scammy shit. We want coaches to do great things for their clients and build successful businesses that also support them and their families. So in this podcast, we're probably gonna do a Q&A. So go through Instagram Q&A, and also whatever coaches will email us to our mentorship email. We'll uh, answer a couple of those questions on that podcast. So if you want, what we can do is right here, we'll put the name of the podcast. So if you're a coach, or you're thinking about becoming a coach, you can listen to this podcast and get a lot of free information about how to improve your coaching program and improve your coaching tactics and strategies to help improve your clients. I would rather you post three times a week on your Instagram feed and have every single one be fucking amazing than post 12 times a week and have everyone be, okay, like not that great. If you have any questions for us that you want us to feature on this podcast, info, what is the email? I don't know the fucking email, what is it? Info at fitnessbusinessmentorship.com will answer your questions on our podcast. <laughs> I am still pregnant. <laughs> um, what am I, like 40 weeks, three or four days now? I am gonna go walk on the treadmill to get, I walk very slow, um, but it's okay. As long as I get some steps in, it helps me sleep. It's good because it can help labor get started which has not happened yet. That's oh, right. I had uh, hot sauce for lunch with chicken. <laughs> well, with lunch. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, with lunch. Like a little on the side. So we're just trying everything. I'm helping her get her shoes on. Yeah. Because she said she just bent over and the baby went nuts. Yeah, she just like, she just got really upset when I put my socks on. I like crunched on this side and that's where her feet are usually on this side. So she's probably like, what are you doing? Do you have a message for your daughter when she watches this in the future? Oh, I love Aww. that. I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> um, hopefully, Jordan will also help you put on your sneaker. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that, like tying. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get really good at tying shoes. Tying shoes. Or we'll get the little Velcro light up ones. I'm also gonna have to learn how to braid hair, I would imagine. I don't really have much practice braiding hair, so I'm probably gonna have to learn how to do that for a little girl. So if I'm bad at braiding your hair, I apologize in advance, but uh, just know that your father did his best. <laughs> we just can't wait till you're here. What, what would you wanna say to her? Let's say she's like 18 years old. She's about to go to college and she's watching these videos Maybe she's in her college dorm room, right? And she's like at her first week of college and she's watching these videos, which is probably the last fucking thing she's gonna do in her first week of college. But let's just say okay. she's in her first week of college. What would, you, what would your message be to her? Where's the time gone, first of all? <laughs> be safe, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> and that we're always here. And I would say you really swelled up your mom's feet. Yeah. Um, but for college, assuming you go, right, which you do not Wait, have to go. Pull the out, you want me to pull the tongue out? I don't like when that feels assuming you do go to college, which you do not have to go. It's not necessary. But let's say you're at college and it's your first week. I would say have a blast. Okay. Have fun. You're only 18 once, right? Like yeah. your great grandma said to you, you're only 18 once, so have fun and be safe, but not too safe, right? It's like you wanna be safe, but not so safe that you don't have fun, right? right? Like enjoy it, have fun. Enjoy you're only this life. age once, it's gonna go by fast. Don't worry too much about your grades. 
I'm not that focused. I don't really care. C's get degrees. All right? But find what you're passionate about. Join clubs. Go out. Find new things. She's, your mom is not liking this. <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm just thinking about what my grandfather always says. He always says D D D T, um, which means don't do dumb things. So, like, have fun, but also like make good choices. That's it. That's what we're saying. Enjoy. <laughs> and now Ema is ready to go walk. I can do this. <laughs> All right, podcast is over. Now we're gonna sit down, Mitch is behind the camera. And if you remember earlier in the video, I spoke about how someone asked, what are some red flags to look for in your coach? How do you know if a coach is good or bad? And like I said, rather than just like bashing coaches, I'm gonna walk you through some of the mistakes that I made as a younger coach. So you can keep an eye out to what to look for in other coaches as well. So we're gonna break this up into three different red flags that, that I made, three different mistakes that I made earlier in my career. The first one being more nutrition based, the second one being more strength training based, and the third one just as more of a mindset based or more of a, an idea from a motivation perspective as a coach, what your job and what your role is. So starting off with nutrition, one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made as a coach and helping people with their nutrition was placing way too much of an emphasis on calories over everything else. Now, I still very much believe that calories are one of the most important things to pay attention to, but it's not that calories are the only thing to pay attention to. Now, I will say this. If your goal is to lose weight, calories have to be in the top two to three things that you're gonna pay attention to, especially if you have a lot of weight to lose and you need to lose weight to improve your health. There's no question about it. But there was a period in my career many, many, many years ago where calories were all that I cared about as a coach. I was like, no, you don't need to worry about micronutrients. You don't need to worry about macros very much. Just calories, calories, calories. And there was an entire movement built around this. It was called IIFYM, if it fits your macros. And it was really like what we started to see was a huge group of coaches, myself included, essentially eating like shit as long as it fit within our calories. And I've said this many times, the fitness industry runs on a pendulum of extremes, right? Either something is really, really good for you or it's really, really bad for you. It's either really, really fattening or it's fat burning. It's either going to heal your pain or it's going to cause you pain. It, there's very little middle ground. And I think this, if it fits your macros community, really grew and exploded so quickly because it went off of the other extreme, which was you can never enjoy your favorite foods. It's either there's clean and there's dirty, there's good foods and there's bad foods. And then as people started to realize, oh no, energy balance, your calories are what matter the most from a weight loss perspective, then the fitness industry, as I was really coming up in the industry, went the complete opposite direction saying, you can eat like shit and still lose weight. And you were having pop tarts and ice cream and cake and pizzas and candies. And that's what we were eating all the time because we could. But even though you can still lose weight just focusing on calories, that doesn't mean what you're doing is necessarily healthy from an overall perspective. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean by this. So one of the things that I used to say is that I'm not a big fan of chia seeds. And the reason I would say that is because chia seeds, they have, frankly, a lot of calories for not so much sustenance. They're not gonna fill you up very much. And so I would tell people avoid chia seeds because they have a very high calories and it's just not worth the calories because it's, gonna, it's, it's easy to overeat them. And frankly, the calories are still worth paying attention to in chia seeds, but I've gone the other direction and, and now that I very much believe the calories are worth it. I believe the calories and chia seeds are worth it because of so many health benefits that come along with them, the fiber and the other aspects. So another, another area that's very similar to this are things like avocados and nuts, right? Avocados and nuts, super nutrient dense foods, very nutrient dense. Uh, avocados are also not just a great source of fat, but also very high in fiber. So much uh, uh, micronutrition and nutrient dense, nutrient uh, dense density within these foods. And I would always say avoid them because they're so high calorie. My mindset being people need to lose weight. They need to keep an eye on their calories and these foods are very high calorie. Now, realistically, no one 
is so overweight and so unhealthy because they're eating too much avocado. That, that's not why we're in an obesity epidemic. It's because of so many other foods that they're eating in such high quantities. So now I'm a huge proponent of making sure you're getting nuts and avocado and different seeds and, and different uh, beans and lentils and all these things that might actually be a little bit higher calorie, but so full of high quality nutrients. Not to mention they're gonna fill you up more and they're gonna help you in your weight loss journey. Even though they're higher calorie, they're still super important for your overall health. And, and what, this really, what this really is important for me to highlight is that, well, health and weight loss are not one and the same they are very closely intertwined. There's a Venn diagram where there's a middle ground here. And I would say, let's say someone is, I don't know, let's say we have a guy who's 12% body fat and he wants to go from 12% to 8% body fat. Well, yeah, now we're really gonna have to pay attention to like, are the chia seeds worth it? Is that avocado worth it? But the vast majority of people are not 12% body fat looking to go from eight to looking to go to 8% body fat. The vast majority of people have a significantly higher body fat percentage and they need to make real big changes to their overall lifestyle to improve their health and also lose weight. And eating avocado, having nuts and seeds, having full fat yogurt, it's not gonna be the thing that prevents them from losing weight and getting healthier. It's the so many other lifestyle factors that are really impacting them. So this is one of the biggest changes I've made as a coach is yes, understanding calories are important, but they're not the only thing that's important, and especially when it comes to your health, not just focusing on calories, but also the overall nutrition that the food is bringing you. Now, do me a favor, if you agree or if you disagree with that, let me know in the comment section what you like, what you don't like, I don't care, just tell me what your thoughts are, and if you're enjoying the video thus far, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you don't already. Now, let's go to mistake number two. Training clients like I was training myself, and this was especially true when I was a competitive power lifter. Now, it's not a coincidence that when I was a competitive powerlifter, that was still relatively early on when I first became a coach, right? And because I was competitively powerlifting and I was also really coming into my own as a coach, it makes sense that I was training a lot of my clients in the way that I was training myself. But looking back, it was a huge, huge mistake. And I see a lot of coaches doing this now, whether it's powerlifting, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's a certain uh, athletic endeavor, I see a lot of coaches training their clients like their clients are athletes or powerlifters or bodybuilders, when the reality is most of our clients, especially in my world, in my end of the industry, they just wanna be healthier. They just wanna move better, they wanna be pain free. They don't necessarily care about having, having shredded six pack abs, they don't care about having bolder shoulders, and there's nothing wrong with these goals, but these are generally higher level, very niche specific clients, whereas the majority of the clients that I worked with, they're just everyday people, they're moms, they're dads, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, who work regular jobs, nine to five, they work a lot, and they just want to be healthier. And I vividly remember as a competitive powerlifter thinking like, okay, well, I squat, deadlift, bench press, super, super heavy, so you have to as well. And while, yes, building strength is important, and those lifts are a great way to do that, not everybody has to barbell squat, barbell bench press, and barbell deadlift, and they definitely don't have to fucking go up to a one rep max and test their maximal, maximal strength if they're just trying to get overall generally stronger and healthier and live a better quality of life. It's probably the biggest training mistake that I made was trying to train all of my clients the same way that I trained myself, which number one, it takes away the whole individuality aspect of training, right? Like each individual has their own personal goals, and that's something for you to pay attention to as maybe you're looking for a coach or who you're looking to follow. If the person you're following or if the coach you're thinking about hiring or the coach you already have hired is not really taking your goals into account, it might be worth looking for a new coach or at the very least having a discussion with your current coach about it. I mean, let's say for example, your goal is to, I don't know, um, get really good at chin-ups and your coach is like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. It's like, well, no, that's what I fucking want to do. So talk to your coach about that. Or let's say, for example, conventional deadlifts really hurt your back. And you've expressed this to your coach. Like, listen, these really hurt my back. And your coach is like, well, we need to do these. You need to do them. It's like, no, you don't. You don't need to do conventional deadlifts. You could do sumo, you could do trap bar, you could do Romanian deadlifts, you could do uh, kettlebell deadlifts, you could do 
you could do suitcase deadlifts. You could do a million different types of deadlifts. There are so many ways to do them. You should never be forced to work through pain. You can always work around it, but you should never be forced to work through it. And if your coach is not listening to you about that, that's when it might be time to rethink it. And I can definitely, definitely remember as a younger coach, I had clients who should have found another coach at that point in my life because I was not giving them what they needed. I was giving them what I needed, not what they needed. I wasn't paying attention to their needs. So pay attention to that. Look at what your coach is saying. Look at how they're acting. Look at how they're programming. And if it doesn't fit in line with your goals, talk with them and or find a new coach. With that said, let's go to mistake number three. When I was a younger coach and I was looking up at the coaches who I admired, there were quite a few of them who would say things like, it's not my job to motivate you, you should motivate yourself. And you know, when you're younger, or really at any point in your life, but you can look up to people and you start to take what they say as gospel. And because they were saying that, I fell into the same mindset as a coach, thinking my clients shouldn't need me to be motivated, they should be motivated themselves, I give you the plan, you do the fucking plan. And as I, number one, coached more people, but also started to study psychology more, I realized that was a massively flawed way of thinking. And the way I think about this is, we all probably have a favorite or a couple favorite teachers from high school or from college where you can remember their names. You remember why you loved them so much. You remember what they did exactly, that why they became your favorite teachers, right? And I can remember mine from high school, Nathaniel Armistead. Mr. Armistead, my history teacher, I had him two different years. And I vividly remember him. I also remember from middle school, uh, Mr. Lambert. Mr. Lambert from middle school. Both of these teachers, they would go in early. They would leave late. They would stay after with me. They would come in early to meet with me to help because I was struggling with these subjects. And so if I ever needed help, they were there for me and they would speak with me and they would go outside the bounds of the, the written portion of their job. They weren't just teaching me during class hours. They came to school early, they stayed late, they helped me after class, they went above and beyond what they had to do. They didn't need to do that. They could have just said, nope, this is what I'm in school, this is what I'm paid for, that's what's done. But now for the rest of my life, I will credit Mr. Lambert and Mr. Armstead and several other teachers with so much of my success because they took so much extra time to help me. And so what I say to coaches now who say things like, my job isn't to motivate you, you should motivate yourself, I gave you the plan, just fucking do it. It's like, listen, if you just wanna be an everyday coach that people forget, if you just wanna be another coach who no one remembers, fine. Just do what you're supposed to do and call it a day. But one of the amazing things about the job that we have as coaches is you have the ability to change people's lives. You have the ability, not, not just like cliche change people's lives, I mean like to literally help them live longer, to help them walk their daughter down the aisle at their wedding, to meet their grandchildren, to pick their grandchildren up, maybe even meet their grandchildren, right? You have the ability to change their lives, the lives of their family, their friends, their colleagues. You have real tremendous power in your hands. And if you wanna be the coach that someone says, hey, you know who changed my life? You know who saved my life? It's this person. It's This is their name. They helped me live longer. They helped me meet my grandchild, my great-grandchildren. They helped me live a better quality of life. They helped me live to 80, 90, 100 years old. And you want them to credit you with that. If you want to be that coach, then yeah, motivation is part of your fucking job. And you got to take that seriously. It's a blessing that you have that opportunity. But again, like if you don't really care about that, which by the way, like I understand if, if you just look at coaching as just like, it's just a means to an end and you're not super passionate about it, then yeah, just give them the plan and let them go on their way. And that's fine. But if that's you, I don't think you'd be watching this video. I don't think you'd make it this far in the video, to be honest. I think if you're at this point in the video and you are a coach, or maybe you're thinking about being a coach, you're passionate about helping people and you really want to make a difference in people's lives. And that's where you gotta go above and beyond. And you have to really be there for them in every and any capacity that you possibly can. And make sure that when they're struggling, you're there to help them. Even outside of simply just giving them the workout plan, giving them the nutrition plan, you've gotta be there to really help them in their deepest, darkest moments to help motivate them when they need it most. So that was a big mistake I made early in my career, and I hope it helps you and yours. All right, questions answered. Work for the day is done, but now I gotta get my cardio in, so. I don't want to do this, but sometimes we got to do things we don't want to fucking do. Let's get after it. So these are sprint pillars. So 
basically going to do in very short bursts. So I'm going to go for a uh, quick warm up. So I'm going to do about a, a three quarters of a mile warm up at a pretty low intensity. And then from there, I'm going to do four rounds. I'm going to do a half a mile sprint, then a 0.1 mile sprint, and then a 0.1 mile sprint, but like at different intensity. So the, the 0.5 mile sprint is going to be at an eight and a half on the treadmill. Then the next 0.1 mile sprint will be at an eight, and then the next one will be at a 7.3. And we'll repeat that, that circuit three or four times then take a quarter of a mile break. Then I'm gonna do the next circuit, repeat this four times. So I'm gonna do uh, 0.5 of a mile, or sorry, 0.05 of a mile at 8.4, then 0.1 of a mile at a 9.9, .9, and then another 0.1 of a mile at a, at a 5.9. I'm gonna repeat that four times. And, uh, and then a recovery half mile jog, and that'll be it. First, first round of forge over. Have a quarter of a mile break at five. And I'm gonna do harder sprints now. So the workout gets harder as I go. So feeling good, but got about four more rounds left. I think that's it. I thought I'd only done three, but I think I miscounted. Whew, that sucked. But I feel really good, honestly. Way better than last week. It's just like being able to now maintain 5.5 speed after 28 minutes of pretty high intensity running. Now, like, while still being able to hold this conversation, I'm very, very happy with this. So, you know, it's also interesting, like, I'm a higher body fat now than I was when I was at my leanest, right? Even when I wasn't at my leanest, like probably around like 15, 16, 17% body fat, which is not lean, not super lean, especially by fitness industry standards. But my health and my performance is legitimately the best it's been in my entire life. I'm not the strongest I've ever been. I'm not the leanest I've ever been, but the healthiest and the overall best performance ever even with a slightly higher body fat. So I mean, fuck, I feel really good. I feel very, very good. And I'll tell you, pretty worn out after that, but I'm not too worn out to where I can't answer some Instagram questions. So let's get into it. All right, so like I told you in the last video from last week, we're gonna start answering at least a couple of Instagram questions in every video. So let's get into that right now. Question number one from this week's Q&A is from Kayla Brown.insta, and she said, how do I build confidence? Which is a very common question, I get it all the time, and I should preface by saying, I'm not an expert in the realm of confidence. I'm sure there are people who literally, this is their profession, probably psychologists or anything, who, who literally spend all of their career writing papers and theses and, and all of that around this. But I will give you my thoughts. And to give you my thoughts on building confidence, I'm gonna tell you a little story. First and foremost, I will say this. I think confidence, like basically everything, is a skill that you can improve in. Also, I think there's a genetic component to it. I think some people are naturally more confident than others. But just because there's a genetic component doesn't mean you can't improve. For example, I fucking suck at basketball. I'm terrible, I'm awful. There's, I knew from the time I was a young kid I would never make it to the NBA, but just because I wouldn't make it to the NBA doesn't mean I couldn't become a much better basketball player than I am right now if I spent the time developing that. And so while there is a genetic component and some people are naturally more confident than others, you can still improve that skill set. Now, the story I'm gonna tell you, many of you, especially if you listen to my podcast, if you don't listen to my podcast, what are you doing? Jordan Syatt Mini Podcast, we'll put the, the thing right here, the link in the, in the description of the video. But if you listen to my podcast, you've heard me talk about how I actually got into coaching when I was 14 years old. Uh, I got into it from wrestling. 
started wrestling at eight years old. And then I started wrestling, I, I fell in love with it. I made varsity as a freshman in high school. I beat a junior out for the varsity spot. And I was good from a technique and endurance perspective, but because I was 14 years old and I didn't have much strength going up against mainly 17 and 18 year olds, I knew I needed to get stronger, but I didn't know how to do that. So I applied to a gym a couple towns over from me and I just wrote them an email and I was like, listen, I'll take the trash out, I'll clean the floors, I'll do anything you need, just let me come and learn from you. And so I started doing this. When I was 14 years old, I was really lucky because the gym accepted me and they were also very science-based. But I'll never forget this. The very first time, several months into working for them, the very first time they said, Jordan, you're gonna teach the warm-up today to the class. I almost shit myself, and I'm not kidding. Like, you know when you get so scared that like your butthole starts to quiver, like you're a kid and maybe your dad's really mad at you and like literally you're like, oh my God, like you feel like everything inside you is about to fall out of your asshole. I was so scared because they were like, you're gonna teach the warm up today. Not a whole, whole workout, just like the 10 minute warm up for this class. I was so scared and my voice was shaky and my hands were shaky and I was up in front of the class of, I don't know, 10 to 12 adults and I was like, all right, we're gonna do our ankle rolls now and we're gonna do like our knees and our hips and like I was petrified. It, I was so scared because I'd never done it before. I had never gone through that process and then the next time I did it, I was still scared shitless and the next time I did it, I was still scared shitless but after a hundred times of doing that, it was fine. I, I went from being scared shitless to being like, oh, I'm totally fine with this because I've done it so many times. So going back to the original questions, well, how do I build confidence? The only way to build confidence is to do something that you're not confident in. And you have to build up the ability to be good at it and to trust in yourself and also to trust in the worst case scenario. And I think this is really important. Anytime I'm nervous about doing something, my brain immediately goes to, well, what's the worst thing that happens? For example, I know many, many guys are very worried to go talk to a woman that they don't know. They're super like, oh my God, I'm really nervous. I don't know what to say. And, and I'll always be like, well, what's the worst thing that happens? You go and talk to her, worst thing that happens, she's like, I'm not fucking interested. Cool, that's fine. You're not hurt. There's nothing bad that happens. She's just not interested. That's literally the worst case scenario. So the only way to build confidence in anything in life is to do it first and honestly to fail because the first time you try it, you're probably going to suck. But you see what's the worst case scenario. Nothing really bad happens, no one really cares, so you try it again. Maybe a little bit better, but still fail. Try it again, a little bit better, but still fail. And over and over and over after a lot of failures and a lot of realizing that no one gives a shit and nothing really bad happens, you build confidence and you get better and you get better and you get better. So I know this is a very general answer, but the reality is the only way to build confidence is to try to push yourself outside your comfort zone, do something that scares the shit out of you, and eventually you're gonna be more confident with it. All right, so question number two and the last one for this video, and actually before we get into that, if you've made it this far, Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you've liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you don't already. And again, just it really means the world to me if you've made it this far in the video. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so question number two from Pagan12 on Instagram asked, why are meal plans overrated? And this is something I have been very outspoken about, like why I'm not a big fan of meal plans. Um, we have all probably heard the saying, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, he eats for the rest of his life. And that's very much how I think about meal plans. If I just give you a meal plan and I say, okay, so you can have like eight ounces of turkey and four ounces of sweet potatoes and this much of this, and like this is your meal for the day. It's like, well, that might be great for when you can follow it, but what happens the moment you can't follow that? What happens when you go on a road trip? What happens when you go away for the weekend? What happens if you have to stay late at work? What happens if the grocery store is out of that ingredient? What happens if any number of these things happen, right? Like life is not as neat and orderly as we would probably want it to be. And maybe, you know, we might think we want it to be that neat and orderly, but probably not. It would be super fucking boring. Like, it would not be a fun life to have it be, okay, I'm going to have three ounces of turkey and two ounces of broccoli and six ounces. That would suck if that's what you had to do every day. And as soon as you're put in a situation in which it's not feasible to do that, you freak out. It's like, this is against my plan. This is against the meal plan that my coach gave me. It's like, 
life is not meant to be lived on a fucking menu or a fucking like plan. This is exactly what you have to follow. And even if I say you can substitute a different meat for this amount, even if I say you can substitute a different carbohydrate, just because I wrote sweet potato, you might think, oh, so I can't have white potatoes. Or if I say white potatoes, like, oh my God, so I can't have sweet potatoes. Or whatever it is, if I say broccoli, oh no, I have to have broccoli, I can't have cauliflower. Even if I tell you you're welcome to make substitutions, odds are in your head, you're like, well, he wrote that for a reason, so this is what I have to do. Not to mention, this is another aspect of it, and this is when I would work with clients from all over the world when I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. If I got a client from Singapore saying, hey, could you write me a meal plan? The foods that I have in Dallas, Texas, are often very different than what you have in Singapore. And fuck, never mind Singapore, the foods I have in Dallas, Texas are often very different than what you have in Maine, in the same country. They're very different than what you might have in California. Where you live is a huge dictator of the foods that you'll have available, not to mention even within the same exact city, my neighbors, maybe they grew up with from a different culture. So they are used to eating different foods. I have neighbors who are Indian. They might not have the same foods that I have on a regular basis. So if I give them a meal plan based off of what I eat, it might not go with what they prefer to eat. And actually, like I said in the last video, the most important thing, the most important non-negotiable of your nutrition is you have to enjoy the foods that you're eating. So my goal as a coach is to help you understand how to incorporate your favorite foods into your nutrition. I don't want to make a meal plan and say, this, you have to have this type of turkey or this type of steak or this type of vegetable. I don't wanna do that. I wanna tell you, I wanna teach you how to enjoy your favorite foods, the ones that you grew up with, the ones that you enjoy most, the ones that mean the most to you, not just that taste the best, but also have feeling and spirit and, and really matter to you as a person, that you have nostalgia with the ones that your mom or your father cooked for you growing up, whatever it is. Like, I want you to be able to enjoy those foods on a regular basis, and a meal plan doesn't take that into account. So rather than giving you a short-term fix, hey, just follow this, I wanna teach you how to eat for the rest of your life. And that's what a meal plan really, really lacks. All right, so that's it for this video. If you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you don't already. And if you have any more questions, or if you would like me to write your workout programs, you'd like me to teach you uh, how to eat in a way that supports your goals, if you want to be a part of an amazing community, join the Inner Circle. What are you waiting for? It's $24.99 a month. Go to sfinnercircle.com, sign up. I would love to have you. And that's it. I'll, uh, I don't know when the next video is gonna be, probably in the next couple weeks. Um, we have an inducement date for our baby uh, within the next week or so. So if, uh, if she's not here by then, I don't know what the fuck is gonna happen, but within the next couple weeks, we'll have a new video up. And I just, I really appreciate all of you, the kind words, the support, the love. I appreciate you very much. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll talk to you soon.